Good morning. Thank you for your uh, gracious words. And it's an honor to be here. Um, the first time I came to Melbourne, I had the privilege of having Yechidus with your father in his little uh, room there. Um, and I had many interesting conversations, his candid and blunt uh, way of putting things, <laughs> um, both here in Melbourne and, of course, also in New York. I remember once we took him for, uh, uh, we were going to some simcha and he needed a ride, so he was in the car, me and my sister, and we just couldn't stop laughing for an hour. and We couldn't let him go. We, you know, he had to go to the simcha, but we just stayed in the car with him, and that was that. Um, so you all, he's a legend here, so uh, I don't need to tell you all the different stories, but just wanted to mention that. Okay. So Melbourne, of course, is a very close place in the heart of the Rebbe. Uh, the, it was the Friedrich Rebbe that first sent the first shluchim here, and then the Rebbe, of course, uh, took that uh, to another level. I vividly remember... I was a kid, about 10 years old, when the first shluchim, the bachrim, that were sent by the Rebbe in 1967, the winter of 67. One of them was my uncle, actually, my mother's brother, Hirschel Lipsker, and uh, the others. And the p impact that they've had on this community, I'm sure some of you are aware of, maybe you're not all aware of, but I've heard from many of the shluchim that are both here in uh, Melbourne and Sydney and other cities, as well as all over the world, that literally it changed their lives because in a sense they first, for the first time, experienced the Rebbe like firsthand, his, his Bochrim, his students. So I've grown up on many different stories about this distant land down under called uh, Australia. And then when I came and saw it myself, I remember it was over 20 years ago, I think, that um, so I saw it with my own eyes and uh, it's quite impressive a place that is so distant in certain ways. Uh, but as the Rebbe said, the farther, the closer. The meaning the more distant, the more close. And, uh, and it's very uh, encouraging to see also the um, seeds planted here by the generations of Chassidim and the Rebbe's efforts to come to fruition. And it just gives strength to the entire uh, community. And I will bring back the warm regards and uh, beautiful experiences that I have had here these past few days. I'll be here another day or two. So I wanted to thank you all for that. Um, whether you know it or not, or whether you believe it or not, the Rebbe called you all Noshim uh, Tzitkanius, which means righteous women of our generation. So I don't know if you see yourselves as Tzitkanius or not. Um, I'm sure your husbands do, but... Uh, <laughs> But that's the, they're, they're subjective because it's, it reflects on their choices. You know, like that guy that said uh, that my wife, if she can tolerate me, she must be a tzitkanis. <laughs> and the husband of a tzitkanis is a tzaddik. So that makes me a tzaddik. You know. um, it's a joke. <laughs> American humor, you know. So, uh, but the Rebbe, however, is not just uh, loose with words. If he describes people a certain way, and it describes you as the Noshim Sitkanis of the generation. So I stand here humbled to speak before you more than I do before men because the Rebbe didn't call them the Tzadikim of the generation. <laughs> and being that I grew up in a home with a very Yechzidosh and strong women in my life, um, I, uh, I see the power that the Rebbe gave women in this generation and calling you in your merit, Mashiach will come. Literally, just like in the merit of the women in the time of Mitzrayim, in the Shchus Noshim Sitkanis of that time, the Jews Niglu Avesenim in Mitzrayim, the Jews were redeemed from Egypt. So, as always, the Rebbe, when he looks at people, he looks at what we're capable of, not just what we are. You know, our potential, our uh, abilities. So, Rebbe, besides just making a statement, is really telling you what you're capable of, what you should be doing, and what your leadership should be like, and leading your community, your families, your community, and the Jewish people in general, to the Gul. So that's what I want to focus my words on, because we're here in honor of 25 years of Gimel Tamas. You know, we just use this very vague Gimel Tamas word, whatever it means to everybody. Everybody has their own feelings or no feelings. And, uh, however, it's definitely connected to the Rebbe. And it poses its own challenges, because 
physically, we don't have the Rebbe with us. And yet, the mission continues. The Rebbe made it very clear the mission does not end, God forbid, in any way. It continues in many ways. We're even more responsible now. Because it was easy, relatively, to send people to New York, see the Rebbe. The Rebbe would take care of business. Today, we are now the arms and legs. So we have great, great serious responsibility. And as history, we'll look back at this period in time. Really, it's unprecedented period. Because 25 years without a physical Rebbe. Chassidim never had that. Seven generations, they had a Rebbe. Every Rebbe was followed by the Rebbe afterwards. So we can look at it as, as uh, daunting or uh, incomprehensible or even sad and cry about it. Or we can do as the Rebbe trained us, to rise to the occasion. That when history does write this chapter, we'll say that we rose to the occasion and we did something about it. Which of course would be the biggest Kiddush Hashem, the biggest way of sanctifying the Rebbe himself. Because God forbid we don't, that reflects what did the Rebbe educate, what kind of generation did he bring up. So we have a serious responsibility. And I say this to myself all the time. We all have our challenges. But we also have a tremendous uh, gift and responsibility because we will shape how Chabad and Lubavitch will look and what the Rebbe's vision and mission and how it will or, God forbid, not be fulfilled. So to me, when I think of the 25 years, I think of it more like, did we do the job or not? Would I be comfortable standing in front of the Rebbe right now and giving him a duch, an accounting and saying, okay, what exactly did you do? I told you 28 years ago, do everything you can to bring the gula. So give me a report, exactly what did you do? Now, I'm not here to say, Musa, I'm speaking to myself as I speak to you. We did many things. I'm sure all of you are Musa Nefers to bring up families. Everybody has their challenges, community issues, so on and so forth. So we're not, I'm not even suggesting that we haven't done great things. But the Rebbe always wanted the destination. He wanted the full picture. He wanted the gu'ula. So it's not about looking at what we did, it's looking at what we didn't do to achieve that. So I'm not in any way uh, underestimating or in, under, under uh, qualif- uh, valuing that which was accomplished. We're talking here what we could do. I don't want to be here sitting just patting ourselves on the backs and saying we've accomplished so much. Even though there is a time for that, we need to do that. It's important to acknowledge accomplishments. But since I'm here, I think I'm here to do a little more than that, and that is to help motivate, to move it forward. And what else can we do? What should we do? So, I share a story with you that I heard from the people that it happened with. There was a couple, Shliach and Ashlucha, or by the Rebbe. And, um, <clears throat> and the Rebbe, as always, looked at them as partners. And first the man, the husband, gave his report. Then the Rebbe turned to his wife and said, you as an equal partner with your husband, so tell me what you're accomplishing and what you're doing in your community. And she began sharing the things she's involved in, very impressive. And then she just felt, you know, you're standing in front of your Rebbe, in front of your father, you just open up. And she said she felt that she's comfortable to share with the Rebbe. She says, but I have to say, Rebbe, you know, as much as I'm a partner in my mind, it's my husband that gets all the credit, and everybody's always complimenting him. And even though I'm the one that may prepare the Shabbos or the holiday meals or do other activities, he's always sitting up at the front of the table, uh, which doesn't bother me, but everybody always gives him the credit, and we get, I get less credit. She said it to the Rebbe that way. So I don't know if everybody really recognizes that we're partners. So the Rebbe responded with a smile. He said, you know, absolutely right. You deserve uh, compliments even more than your husband does, perhaps. But you know, we live in a superficial world. In a world that does not appreciate the real things. They appreciate externals. And the Rebbe gave an example. He says, when you come into a house, what do people compliment? They compliment the furniture, the paintings on the wall, the upholstery, the externals, the food. You never see someone come into a house and say, wow, what kind of powerful foundation this house must be resting on. Even though without the foundation, there'd be no house. There'd be no building. But no one sees the foundation. It's invisible. And no one appreciates it. They talk about the externals, which can always change. So though, I, again, I say they should be complimenting you, but remember, a woman is a keres abayis, and the foundations are not always appreciated. But I, for one, the Rebbe said, do appreciate it. And that's why you should double and triple your efforts, because it's upon you 
that rests the entire edifice. And all the externals and all the other things, which are probably also important, cannot be without your, don't, your unwavering, strong pillars that you are. That's what the Rebbe said to her. So I thought it's a very good way of looking at the Rebbe through the Rebbe's eyes of what, how he sees the women of our generation. You know, long before feminism was popular, the Rebbe already in the early 50s, literally within months from beginning of leadership, made a big, fight, big, big, a big issue of women being the leaders in their communities. Established Neshei of B'nai Chabad in Israel, in America, and then the chapters all over the world as uh, Chabad spread out. And of course, in halachic way, in a tzniyuzdik way, in a modest way, but made it very clear that women are more than just mothers and wives, that they're also leaders in their own right in the community. And their particular strengths, and perhaps their gentleness, and their other qualities that Hashem blessed them with, can actually transform communities. How many times I personally heard from the Rebbe, where the Rebbe would quote this statement, Ishak Sheira Eser Tzayn Baila, who is the kosher woman, who is the righteous woman, the one who everyone interprets as being fulfills her husband's will. Which, of course, again, feeds into all these stereotypes that women are just listening to their husbands. And the Rebbe interprets and says, Eser Tzayn Baila doesn't just mean to fulfill, it also means to create. Asa means to create their husband's will. So which one is it? To fulfill or to create? And the Rebbe answers that if their husband is saying the right things and doing the right things, the husband, the woman, of course, goes along. But if he's not, the woman will create the right will to make sure he does the right thing. So then, of course, the question is, who decides? And the Rebbe said, Hashem blessed women with the wisdom to know when to distinguish when the husband is doing the right thing or not. So that's the power you have in the... And the modern humorous version of it is that the man wears the pants in the family and the woman tells him what pants to wear. You know, you don't have to share this with your husbands. As, you know, always be wise in these matters. Um, it took me 30 years to learn this and then I realized I thought I was the boss and then I found out not, not exactly. So you have to always uh, uh, so-called uh, nurture and pamper a man's ego to make sure he feels that he's important. And each one of you will figure out how to do that properly. But the Rebbe made it very clear. Eser, Tzayn, Baila, the two versions. There's a famous story with Arizal. The holy Arizal, the great Kabbalist in Svas in the 16th century. So the Arizal one Friday told his Talmidim, his students, let us all go to Yerushalayim. And, um, which meant, let us go to the Gula, time for Mashiach. The story goes, it's a story the Rebbe's told, so, so it's an accurate story that some of the students said, we have to go first tell our wives or ask our wives. The Rizal heard that. He said, okay, clearly the time has not arrived for you to go to the Gul. And the Rebbe, in many sikhs, especially if you want to look it up, Pasha Shmini, Shabbos Pasha Shmini, Tavshin Chai, it would be 1958. The Rebbe asked the question, what, kind of, what is that? Shalom bias? Husband just disappears on Friday afternoon with Arizal. What's wrong with going to tell his wife or ask his wife? Maybe she wants to come along, go to the Gula. Why is he leaving his family behind? And the Rebbe said that Rizal was a Rebbe and he knew all these halachas. And if he said so, he knew that's the right thing to do and the woman would be happy. And he read says that the men were not doing it because of Shalom Bayez. They were doing their own chashbenes. But the Rebbe once said in the Fabrein in the following, or the end of the story, I should say, so the Arizal said, okay, time has not come, and he remained, and the Gula didn't come then. So the Rebbe once said in the Fabreng in the following, he said, this time around, because of what happened then, when Mashiach is ready to come, he's not going to go to the men first, he's going to go to the women first. And it's based on a medrash with the Chetet Sadas. I'll tell you about that in a second. He's going to go to the men first, the women first, sorry. And the Rebbe says, so the women shouldn't make the same mistake and say they have to ask their husbands. They should go to the Gula and the husbands will come running, guaranteed. That was the Rebbe said. So there you have a directive. So keep that in mind when the time comes. Now what does this all mean? This is not, God forbid, to create some uh, tension or rifts. It means that when people are dedicated to what is right, what Hashem wants, or what the Rebbe wants, or Mashiach wants, then you march forward and the people who, are, uh, who, are, who understand will be happy that you did so. 
This was always the, what Chassidish people always understood. I remember when the first boys were going to yeshivas all over the world. And um, so they were going to yeshiva. We were together, my own friends, in school. And then they were chosen to go to New Haven and Los Angeles and Miami and, of course, Melbourne and other cities all over the world. So I remember the Rebbe, people would come, the parents with the, with the students. They were, like, at that point, 16 years old, 15, 17 years old age, going on different shlichas. And this is, I'm talking now, when it started, was in the mid-70s. So the Rebbe would stand in Gan Eden Atachim, that's the room right near the Rebbe's main room, inner sanctum, and he would give either a, a mimer or a kuntris or some booklet and a dollar to all the people going, to all the students, and then to their parents. And one year, one of the times, the Rebbe said the following words, he said to the parents, after he gave a bracha to the students, he said to the parents in Yiddish, I'll just say it because the original, and then I'll translate it. The Rebbe said, A dank far ufadav in the kinder bizaher, ufun isten weiter nemerzef meine places. Thank you for educating and bringing up your children till this point. And from here, I take, I, from here on, I take them on my shoulders. I take, I take responsibility. Now, many people would think if they didn't know better. One second, these are my children. They'll always be my children, if they're 15 or 25 or 55 or whatever age. And when the Rebbe is like taken, and but Chassidish parents know this is the biggest bracha you could have, that you did everything possible to become soldiers in the Rebbe's army. And the greatest kibbutz Ava aim is for them to listen to what the Rebbe has to say, not necessarily what you have to say. And hopefully you're aligned with what the Rebbe wants. So for, for, for parents, they consider that the biggest honor. And I hope everybody understands the point. That's how it is, because we understand that we are here to serve a higher purpose. And the greatest gift is us as parents is to bring up our children to understand what that purpose is. So when the time comes and they become, start becoming adults, they will be clear to them that why they were sent to this world. That is the bottom line. I was speaking, I speak often to students uh, from the Chabad schools, our own schools in New York and other cities. And uh, today there are a lot of questions people have. As I said, because the Rebbe is not here physically, and you don't have the Fabrengans, and you don't have that ongoing presence and, and stimulation and all the energy, the Rebbe literally was a walking source of that energy, whether it was uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur or Sukkot Simchus Teda, or just regular day in the week. And the dollars, and the Fabrengans, Yutas Kislev, and Yut Shvat, and Yud Alef Nisan, and Purim, and Chofov. I mean, the whole thing. It was a live, vibrant world. We don't have that today. However you twist and turn, we don't. And that had tremendous impact on people, because being in the presence of the Rebbe was like a tremendous source of not just inspiration, it changed our lives. It shaped us. It's what empowered people to go out all over the world and have the strength to carry the message because they were empowered and they were educated and um, charged with this mission. So today, we all have this question. I mean, who doesn't as a parent? As a, you know, who's going, what will be the inspiration? Who are our leaders? Even if we have some good leaders, they're not Rebbes. They're not a Rebbe. And yet we know without question that the Rebbe said many times that a shepherd never forsakes his flock. And he was always with them, even though we don't see it. And he gives them the strength to forge ahead. And like the Rebbe said a number of times by his, by his father-in-law, that a Rebbe that the Rebbe took care of everything. He anticipated everything. That if you dig deeper, you can find answers to all our dilemmas. Yes, it was a lot easier before Gimel Thomas, because you can directly ask. Today you have to dig deeper, but it's there. And I can tell you from a, on a personal note that I deal with many, many different issues, and people write to me questions, and I have a program Sunday night, and so on. My life is supplied. I am constantly amazed at the relevance of the Rebbe's messages that he said years ago. And literally, almost on a daily basis, I find something new, and I say, wow, you know, I didn't see that. And I've really seen a lot. I have to tell you, it's my whole life. I've been doing this for many years. And I continuously find answers to questions that we have, real contemporary issues. And I'm getting into how the Rebbe knew, but it's there. And just a matter of sometimes digging a little deeper and finding it. But it comes with a firm conviction that we have the answers. 
You know, when you know it that you have it, then it's just a matter of time and a matter of effort. If you don't know it, that's where the problems become. And how do you convey that conviction? So we use the Rebbe's words, and I think part of what the Rebbe meant when he said that the women have, the women have a special role in this matter, Nashim Sitkonius, is because in some way, as it says in Medrash, they have a little more amuna. That's what it says. Not that the men don't have amuna and faith, but sometimes it can be a little more concealed, whether it's due to ego, whether it's due to materialism, whether it's due to other distractions. But women have a little more consciousness of it. And that's why, what happened in Mitzrayim? What taka was the reason? What is the reason that the women were in their merit? What, the men didn't do anything? Moshe Rabbeinu was a man. He had no effort, he had no uh, share in, the, in redeeming the Jews. Yet it says, B'schus Nashim Sidkonis. And the answer is actually an answer in the Gemara that says the following. It says that when Pari decreed, Pari decreed that the Jewish boys, because he had heard from his stargazers, that a Jewish man would rise from the Jews who would redeem the Jewish people. So he came up with a brilliant idea. Let's kill all the boys. Kol Ben, everyone, every Zohar, every male boy that was born to the Jews, he thrown into the River Nile. Terrible decree, like a genocide. And, and who knows how many were killed. So what did the men, the men were practical and businesslike, they said, you know what, as long as this decree stands, we shouldn't have any children. Because we don't know if it will be a boy or a girl. We don't have any children. That way we don't have the problem. They won't be killed. And the women said, absolutely not. If we don't have children, how will we ever leave this God-forsaken place? And we were promised, Avram, Yitzhak, Yankov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah were promised that we would be redeemed from this hell. So we must have children. What about the decree? We'll figure it out. And they did. Children were killed, it's true, but the women would go out to the fields, the Gemara says, and when they were expecting, and Hashem did different miracles, and they bore children. And of course, the man that would be most important, Moshe Rabbeinu, Yechevet had this child, and she made a basket, and she waterproofed it, and put him in the river Nile, and we know the story. That's why it's called Moshe. Minamayim Mishisua, because the daughter of Pare drew him out of water. That's the only name we know. We don't even know the name that his parents gave him. So the women figured it out. What was it the women knew that the men didn't know? Why didn't the men think of that? Because they had the Munna Pshuta in the promise. That Hashem made a promise and they knew it will happen. We don't know how and when, but it's going to happen and we have to have children and families to be able to tzivus Hashem to march out of this place. The main thing is that Pare could not fight that. Because Pari in his, um, we could say, callous mind, like all the anti-Semites in history, thank God, thought the enemy is going to be the males. Who's going to, who's going to challenge the Egyptian army? Men, they're strong. Women and children could be subdued. They thought the only way that can challenge them is arms, is ammunition, is weapons. They didn't know one small little secret. That Jewish strength doesn't come from weapons or from armies or from men and from brute strength. It comes from faith, amuna. And as the woman that amuna, Tariq had no idea. How do you fight amuna? You can't fight amuna. With what do you fight? What, what weapon? What army can fight faith? It was the faith of the women that was able to withstand Tariq's plans. So he thought he'll kill the men. Great. The woman he'll control. He didn't realize that was the woman was the challenge because he never would imagine that faith would have such power. And it's exactly that faith that saved the Jewish people. And that's exactly in our time as well. So when I think about it this way, we think about it this way, Gimel Thomas is a challenge. And many people ask questions like, you know, do we have a Rebbe? Rebbe's not here anymore. You know, maybe it's over. It was a nice ride. I'm only saying this just to point out what people are saying. Many people don't say this openly. But people tell me this privately, sometimes more directly, sometimes less directly. You know, it was a nice ride, it was a nice, beautiful, but now, you know, we'll all wait, Mashiach will come one day. And I understand where they're coming from, because B'der HaTeva, you look around, that's what you see. You see that the Rebbe is not here, there's no one filling his shoes, and uh, so what are we left with? 
However, what Amuna dictates is, as I said before, that a Rebbe is always with us. The Rebbe Marash, the fourth Chabad Rebbe, was nostalgic on Yud Gimel Tishrei, Tafresh Mem Gimel. Right before Sukkis, year 1842. Since it was before Sukkis, and then it was a time before texts and emails and so on, so it took a while till the news got around. So the Chassidim in Lubavitch in the city where it happened knew. But everywhere else, it took time. Over Sukkis, slowly the Chassidim found out about these Talkas. In a city called Chernigov, there was the Rav there, was a big Chassid. His name was Radat, Rabdovitz Tzvi Chain. So the news came on a Shaina Rabbe. Until then, no one knew of this Talkas, of the, the passing of the, of the Rebbe Marash. By Hakafis, Simchas Shmini Atzeres night in Shul. That's when Rab David Tzvi Rab Dats was told. Chassidim told him the Rebbe is avek. That's an expression the Rebbe left. Now he was a real Chassid. What happened was he was so taken he fainted, and they could not, for the life of them, revive him. They brought doctors. Nothing could revive him. He was completely out, which itself was danger. No one knew what to do. So they ran to his father's house. His father was a Peretzchein. He was an older chassid who had even seen the Alter Rebbe. But he was, very, he was not well, so he couldn't come to shul. But they thought he was the only person, maybe, to ask him what to do. And they actually carried him to shul. So he comes to shul. He sees his son lying there, faint. And he bends down and he whispers to his son, A Rebbe get kemel nisht avek. A Rebbe never leaves. And that revived him. And he stood up. Still sad, but that gave him the strength. And that's pure Amunna. Because if he's a Rebbe, he's a Rebbe. If he was a Rebbe before Gimel Thomas, he's a Rebbe now. And if he wasn't a Rebbe before Gimel Thomas, God forbid, then yes, then there's no problem. Then, of course, Rav Shmuel Munkis, you know the story of Rav Shmuel Munkis. How many do you know? There aren't that many. There are quite a few. They're all humorous. Yeah, he was like uh, one, I'll tell you the one. And it's, this story actually had a very personal impact on me. I was 21 years old when the Rebbe had a heart attack on Shemini Atzeres, Tov Shalom Ches, 1977. And it was a serious time. The Rebbe, they called a killer heart attack. Most people didn't know, but I knew. And it was not, it was serious. I mean, thank God, it turned around and became even, the Rebbe became stronger than ever. Literally, Fabrengans and everything doubled in output afterwards, but we didn't know that at the time. So it was a big scare. And as a 21-year-old, you know, then there was no language, or even a consideration that mortality would affect the Rebbe in any way. However, in my own thoughts, and I can confess, I did think, I said, what's going to happen if God decides to take the Rebbe? And what happens to all of us? We all signed up for this, our life, you know, we've given away our lives for the Rebbe's cause. And suddenly, what happens? You couldn't really talk about it because it was far it was taboo to speak about these type of things. But these are some of the thoughts that were uh, percolating in my mind. And, uh, and that's when I read the story of Rabbi Shmuel Munkus. Perfect time. And the story goes like this. It's documented today, the Rishimus of the Rebbe. The Rebbe writes it up in detail. More details than we usually knew. I found those details later. But the basic story is this. They were coming to arrest the Alter Rebbe. Yutis Kislev story. The Alter Rebbe had a hiding place where he would hide in case the soldiers or anyone came, he would hide there. So he, uh, the knock on the, at night, there was a knock on the door. And yeah, and the, the Alter Rebbe went to hide. The soldiers came in. This is the way it's written up in the Rebbe's Shimas, the Rebbe's writings, the Rebbe's manuscripts. They came in and they started asking her, where's your husband? She doesn't know. And they slapped her. It says they knocked out a tooth. It's part of the story. And okay, then they left. The al Rebbe came out of the hiding place. And what do you know, five minutes later or ten minutes later, there's another knock on the window. They get frightened again. They peek out and they see it's Rabbi Shmuel Munkis. So they let him in. al Rebbe says to him, Du kumst echt bei Nacht. You also come at night, which is an expression like you're also frightening us. You know, who comes at night? Mazikim come at night. The, the destructive forces. You also come at night. So he says to the Alter Rebbe, I didn't know that by the Rebbe there's a night. 
Obviously, it didn't mean physical. I meant that there's something to be frightened. So the Alter Rebbe says to him, what do you think I should do? They're coming to arrest me. Should I cooperate or should I not? Should I go into hiding? And that's when Shmuel Munker, Shmuel Munker said the following memorable words. Okay. He said the following memorable words. And not, they're not, they were so harsh that, that some of them are not even printed. You'll see dot, dot, dot in the, dot in the text. But I'll tell you what it says there. He said to the Alter Rebbe the following. He says, Memon of Shach. Either or. If you're a Rebbe, a true Rebbe, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no night. And nothing will happen to you. So you can allow yourself to get arrested. And if you're not a Rebbe, you deserve, and this is what's crossed out, they only leave dots, you deserve a bullet to your head. That's what it says, a kailing cup. A bullet to your head for taking away the pleasure from so many thousands of chassidim. Pleasure of this world from so many chassidim. Now, I don't know, listen, he must have been some special guy because who could speak to a Rebbe like that? <laughs> but you know what? He said the truth. Because if he's talking out a Rebbe, that's what he deserves of like fooling and conning people. To me, this had a tremendous impact on my 21-year-old impressionable uh, mind. And I said to myself, and I'll be very honest, exactly what I said. I said, you know what? It's time to grow up. You know, if the Rebbe is real to you, you're in. It's not only in when things are shining and the light is shining and everything's beautiful. It's not only you're only here for the party. If you're in and it's true, it's true no matter what. No matter what happens, whatever God's plan is. And if you think it's not true, get out now. Don't just stay when it's, uh, you, don't, you don't have to wait till it's bad times. You, know, don't, you can't be a child. Grow up and be a man and make a decision. That's what I said to myself and that's exactly what I did. The truth of it was convincing enough to me that that's what I'm in. It makes no difference. So many ways, personally, and I'm only sharing it because of my own personal experience, I had my, so to speak, Gimel Thomas moment. I already dealt with my trauma in Toshalam et Ches. Not to say that Gimel Thomas was not painful and sad and challenging, but it was not an existential crisis for me. Because the Rebbe is Emes, and we don't always have it figured out. There's a big God in this world, and he runs the show, not us. Yes, we would have liked it very differently. I don't know why Gimel Thomas happened. We all prefer it didn't happen. I don't see it as part of the plan, but it did. And whatever the meaning behind it is. And I'm not even here to come to try to explain it. But we were trained one way and one way only to forge ahead. The MS of the Rebbe is not impacted. A Rebbe gate came to Shtavek. A Rebbe never leaves. And he's with us. Even if we don't see him, he sees us. And he's here with us right now, here. And with you, with everyone. It's just now the challenges, and that's the only thing that changed. That now we have to do a little more. That we need to pick ourselves up and we have to do, bring, bolster ourselves with each other, with ourselves, to be strong and to represent what the Rebbe would want in this time, in this challenging time. And there's real stakes here. We have children. I have Mitra Shem, some grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And we have communities. And who are they going to look to if not us? And here's where the Rebbe said that women have a particular role. As the Rebbe said many times, in some way they shape children more than the men do. Especially in the early impressionable and formative years. That's how it is. This does not take away the responsibility from your husbands and from the men. You know, right now, the Rebbe would speak a few times a year to the women. And that was what he always would say. He said, you have a particular special role, and especially in a time of crisis. Whether it was in Egypt, or whether it was the time of Purim, or the time of Hanukkah. It's always the woman. As I mentioned, Esther, it's called Megillus Esther. Mordechai had no role. And the Rebbe asked many often, why didn't it say at least Megillus Esther or Mordechai? Completely ignored. His name is not in there. It's like, you know, called um, reverse sexism. That's not the Rebbe's words, it's my words. You know, it's completely not, no credit at all. He didn't have any role. But because the core role was Esther. And then Hanukkah, of course, and other times. This is not from Jewish sources, but they say that a woman is like a tea bag. You don't know how strong she is until you put her into hot water. You know? <laughs> and men, if you put them in hot water, they usually yell and say it's hot. You know? That's how it is. Now listen, I'm a man, so I can make fun of men. So it's not uh, uh, self-deprecating. Uh, um, 
But the bottom line is that you are chosen to be here in this time, this age. Why? We don't never know why we're here. And our education, how we were trained to be soldiers, to march forward. You know, there was a time when the Jewish people were stuck. I mean, there were many times they were stuck. But the word stuck, as I said last night, is not a language of and Taylor, or Yiddish guy, definitely not the Rebbe's language. What was the first place we were stuck between a rock and a hard place? You know where it was? Anybody can guess? Right, exactly. They were standing before the Yamsuf, just left Egypt. The water is before them. The Egyptians are pursuing them from behind. What do you do? There's nowhere to go. So the Rebbe has a classic sikh where he explains that the Jewish people broke into four groups. As always, we always break into groups. We always have different opinions. And here's what they had to say. Some said, surrender. We have to return to Egypt or die here in a massacre? No. Let's return to Egypt. Resignation, surrender. Another group said the opposite. Let's go to war with the Egyptians. A third group said, let's jump into the water and just commit suicide, basically. Because going back is not an option. Staying is not an option. We'll never win this battle. We'll jump into the water. And the fourth group was the most religious group. They said, let's pray. Say Tillin. Now, it doesn't seem like there's any other options. Right? What other option could there be? So Moshe turns to Hashem. He says to Hashem, this is what the four groups are saying. Which one should we, what should we do? So the Pesach says, this is a Talmud Yerushalmi that explains it all, based on the Pesukim, where Hashem responds, you will never go back to Egypt. So that's not an option. Do not jump into the water. That's not an option. That's escapism. Why are, you, why are you crying? Why are you praying? And don't go to war. What should you do? So Hashem said one word. Vaiso. Vaiso. Which means forge ahead. Travel forward. You heard from me hundreds of times that we're marching toward the promised land. That we're marching toward Har Sinai. I'm going to give you the Torah. Why do you doubt me? It's interesting. How did no one came up with this idea? Because they were all using their minds too much. They were trying to figure out some solutions on their own. They forgot there was a promise. And that promise was forge ahead. What will happen? That's not your business. You do what you have to do and I'll figure it out. And what did happen? Nachshinam and Aminodov forged ahead. And the sea split. And we all know that, by the way, the Jews don't need to go through a sea to get to Egypt. The whole story was just to set this up. Look at the, the map. To go from Egypt to Israel, you don't need to go through any water. So the Ebrista took them in a roundabout way just to make a Kriyas Yamsuf, which is a whole other discussion. But one of the lessons was, because he wanted to tell them that you're never stuck. There's no such thing as stuck. Follow your orders. And sometimes you have to just do it blindly and not become I'm a philosopher. It's exactly the lesson to us today. The Rebbe told us we have a mission. We're marching toward the Geula. Each of you have your role. To can't do everything you can. I did what I can. Do whatever you can. Can't figure it out? Talk to people about it. Put your heads together. Figure it out. Be creative. Find ideas. But march forward. That's the bottom line. And I have no doubt that it's the women of the generation that can carry that in many ways more than the men. Men start getting into arguments. I see them all the time. I try not to hang around with them. Because they're always talking about this, you know. Yeah, the Rebbe this and the Rebbe that, this way, that way. And the Vayiso, I've made a personal commitment after Chavzai Noder, when the Rebbe had the stroke, as I mentioned last night, and I'll say here again. I was out of a job. I don't know if I mentioned last night, to be honest. I did? Okay. I don't even remember. It's been speaking so many places. I don't know what I said where. I hope most of what I said here I wasn't said before. That, that I'm pretty sure. Because I didn't speak only to women, you know. So, um, so I was out of a job. Not that that should bother anybody, frankly. But it affected me. But it was more than that. What am I supposed to do with my life? And I had many offers. And I had all kinds of ideas. And then I, I remembered myself. Why you so? You have a job. What you did was you documented the Rebbe's words. And what, why did the Rebbe speak? And why did the Rebbe teach us? To spread your futzah chutzah. To spread and distribute the wellsprings of chassidus chutzah to the farthest outskirts of the world. So there you have your job. Did you reach the outskirts of the world? 
Does the whole world know about Chassidus? And that's when I made a very direct commitment to write toward a meaningful life. And everything after that is, is, um, is my story. Still driven by the very soul of my mission. So I do exactly what I did 40 years ago. I'm just doing it in a different form. Every one of us has to make that by your soul commitment. And that requires, yes, looking into your heart and soul, what you're good at, besides being a mother and a wife and everything else, but what you're good at, and how can you use your particular skills that Hashem blessed you with in some way to bring chsidis, to bring Yiddishkeit, to bring Gula to other people. And it's not that crazy. I'll give you soon some practical examples. That's our challenge today. And as I said earlier, there's no question in my mind that when you get beyond the immediate here and now, and you look with a bird's eye view, a historical perspective, when you look at a historical perspective, this time will be, we will be judged. And I would even say that Rebbe will be looked at and what we did. What did you do in those 25 years? What did you do those years where the Rebbe physically never left us, but physically is not here with us? Did you just lay down and die, God forbid? Or you resigned and went back to Mitzrayim? Did you go into escapism? Did you just end up saying, till him all day? Or are you just battling the battles of life? And the answer is all four are not the option. The option is only by your soul. To take that mission, be ultra-focused, laser-focused, and forge ahead. And you do that, you get involved in machlekes, not involved in sideshows, pettiness. You can rest assured, you can trust, I'm invited to many places to speak. And whenever I see somewhere it's being used as an agenda for one party over another, I'm out of there. Not because I, uh, I don't like politics, I actually don't like politics, but also, it's not my mission. It's not my mission to, to be a party. My mission is to spread chassidus, that's all I care about, to bring the Rebbe's message to people. And I keep ultra-focused, and people say, why can't you come here? And I know right away there's an agenda. I right away stay away from it. People invite me, let's mediate a disagreement. If I could be of help, but I'll never want to become a party where somebody's trying to use you. I remember speaking about this in a, a shleshim in, in five towns in New York. I was talking about the Rebbe's words. The Rebbe said a few times, many times, that the Achdus of Chassidim will bring them to Mashiach. This is a story from the Tzamech Tzedek. He said that their Achdus of Chassidim will bring them to Mashiach. And recently I saw a note from the Rebbe that said that the machlekes among Anash, disagreements among Chassidim, it holds, up, it holds up Mashiach. That if there wasn't Machlekes, Mashiach would have been here already. So I fabrained yesterday this a bit in the fabrain we had in Shul throughout the day. And I say it everywhere I go. The Rebbe Mamish writing in his own handwriting, Mashiach would be here if there was no Machlekes. So how could a person even be part of a Machlekes when you hear something like that? And you know this last parsha, Kedach. You know the story the Rebbe said in one of the Sikhs, the talks he gave to the women? Kedach. The, is, was the quintessential Baal And his wife was part of it. She helped instigate. And Ein Ben Pelas, his wife, sat at the tent and didn't let him be involved. So women have a great role in this regard. So I was speaking about this in the five towns. And I said, each of us are either part of the problem or part of the solution. Chaz Shalom, make a decision that Chaz Shalom ever should be ever talk in your home in front of your children, or in general in your home, your sacred home, of any difference of opinion. Never, never talk about someone, even if you don't like them. You want to talk to your husband about it, go out in the street and take a walk. Even then I would suggest otherwise. But then you may not be able to control. You have to vent. But in your home, in front of your children. Let me tell you what happened. A guy came over to me after my talk. He was there. And he's involved in a lot of arguments. No names, so there's no Loshan Hara. He says to me, your words touched me. And I made a decision. I'm going to call my wife right now that we will never again have any talk. We always talk at the kitchen about this one, about that one, etc., etc. And he keeps thanking me. This is over 20 years ago. He keeps thanking me. He says, I moved out of the shul I was, which was just a gossip shul. That's all we did. And he's changed his whole life. I was very touched by the fact that he was touched by something I shared from the Rebbe. So, if not, and this may be an aside, maybe it's not an aside. Everyone has a role to play. You can very clearly create sanctity in your environments. And it doesn't matter. Machlekes is Hashem Shemayim. People think it's the Rebbe's Kavona. The Rebbe said clearly, Machlekes is Machlekes. And you have a strong role to play in this. Don't underestimate it. 
Because you can make things worse or you can make things better. Eser is saying violet. Remember, you create the will. And there are many things you can do. Be wise and intelligent about it. So to go back to the, the actual point that I was making before about the role of women and the role of all of us is that we have to forge ahead by yourself. So I'm going to give a few examples, a few practical examples that I think that all of us can in some way, in, in some way incorporate in our lives. And it's just suggestions, so you don't have to do it. But maybe it'll give you some thoughts. Maybe you'll come up with your own ideas. So I want to mention a few things. The first thing is, a few years ago, I received a letter, an email, from, uh, from a woman who used to come to my classes many years ago. And she says, I'm now living in another city. Rosh Hashanah is coming. Maybe you have a suggestion to make for a mother of a few children. What can I do this year new to infuse my children with a new chayas, a new passion, a new commitment to Yiddishkeit? She had relatively young children. So I was thinking about it. And then another thing happened. I'm not going to go into the details because it's going to take too long. But someone else, Hashgach Prati, sent me a letter also similar. Bottom line, I came up with a thought which was based on the Rebbe. The Rebbe would often speak to the children, Tzivah Sashem, and the Rebbe was one of the strong statements the Rebbe would always talk about was Moida Ani. In the morning saying Moida Ani. With the explanation that in the morning you declare that Hashem returned, your soul, your soul was returned to you. Moida Ani lefanecha melachai v'kayim shachzate b'nishmasi v'chem l'rabba monasecha. So I wrote a suggestion, not just to this woman, I wrote it up as like an article, Rosh Hashanah's suggestion to parents, that in addition to everything else you say to your children every morning and at night when you put them to sleep, I love you, I care about you, and everything that parents say, let's add one more thing. And I made like a suggested, uh, language, a suggested text. Tell your child... I didn't necessarily use the name of the Rebbe because this went out to many people who didn't even know who the Rebbe is, but it was based, definitely based on the Rebbe's ideas. Tell your child that you are a gift of God that was sent to this world, and I'm honored to have be your parent. Hashem sent you to fulfill a shlichus in this world, a particular mission that you and only you can accomplish. I am dedicated to help you do everything possible to find out what that mission is and then to embrace it and to actualize it. That should be the gist of it. And at night, when you say, similar idea. To infuse children with a sense of mission, sense of urgency. Not just you love them, which is beautiful, but also that idea that we're all here on a mission. A lot I talked about this last night, the idea of mission, purpose, shlichus. And the next year, I got maybe over two, 300 emails of parents, mostly women that wrote to me, I did what you suggested, and it changed our homes because our children started asking, what's a mission? And even at the table, my husband and I and our children would start talking about this, and it became a conversation that we're here in this world to fulfill something. It's not just here to eat off the fat of the land and just enjoy ourselves and make some money and go on vacations. There's purpose to life. So I think, especially chassidish women like yourselves, using taking the Rebbe's cue, this is something... I would not underestimate. You may be doing it already, but it doesn't hurt to really add to it. Because the greatest preventive medicine to all the challenges that we know our children face or will face, and there's plenty of challenges, as you all know, the best preventive medicine is giving children and infusing them with a sense of a calling, of a mission. Every time any parents ask me, what do I do, my teenage son or, or daughter they're bored, blah, blah. They don't want to come to the Shabbos table. They're doing other things. Sometimes it's much worse than that. So I say, so what are they doing with their life? What excites them? Not Yiddishkeit, clearly. So why don't you find something they're good at, a talent, a hobby, something, and direct it to something that has a higher purpose. To just go fight and say to your child, listen, you can't just do this, you can't do that, you end up losing that type. You may win the battle, you won't win the war. But if you can find in your child particular talents and skills. And from early age, direct them. Children that like to read. They're children that are artistic. Every child has their strengths. You can prevent a lot of problems because you've, you've anticipated and you're helping harness those skills towards something positive. Is it a guarantee? There's no guarantees in life. But it sure gives a lot of, as I said, preventive medicine. And this is what the Rebbe said. Even young children, the Rebbe would say, go on, and do things. 
but not only, only out of obligation. They should enjoy it. It should be something that fits their personality. The more passion they have in it, the more as they grow older, they're not going to be a vacuum. What should I do? I'm bored. Because you have something. And this is true across the board. Just before I was speaking to the Kail here, to the men, so someone asked me, what do we do with children with mobile phones and so on and so forth? It's a big dilemma. It's not so simple. You know, very young age, of course, you can control it. But a little older, they go to friends, and then you become a situation. If you start becoming too harsh, they will lie to you, they'll be resentful, etc. So I don't have a real a perfect solution. But I always think about the Rebbe's attitude to technology. Like you're telling your child, if you're going to use already an email or some social media, and if, if, if you can't control it anymore, let's put it that way, five messages of, of something, a Yiddishkeit or Chsiddishkeit or warmth or a warm message to people. Teach them that technology was created by God in order to use it to spread goodness. Now, is that going to solve all the problems? No, but at least it creates an alternative where you're using it. Instead of just telling someone, don't read books because you don't know what book you'll read, Read the right books and read books and use it for the right direction. Eli Lipsky, you may know, Olav Shalom was a musician. He was one of the first Chabad Hasidic musicians. In 1962, he was studying in 770. Dan Hola, the faculty of the yeshiva, saw he wasn't always coming to Seder, to the, to the classes. So they checked him out. And they, like, you know, they did some investigation. They found out he's going to take music lessons. For them, that was a music lesson. You came from Israel to study in 770, Eastern Parkway, in the main yeshiva. You're taking music lessons. So they were going to th send them back to home, to Israel. Now then they asked the Rebbe everything. So they come into the Rebbe. They say, we have a student, and that's what we're going to do. The Rebbe s said to them, who pays for his music lessons? So they say, we don't know. He probably pays for it himself. The Rebbe said, on Hola, the school should pay for the music lessons because you never know that the nachas that the chassidish world will get from the chassidish music he's going to create one day. So they called in Ella Lipsker, Rabbi David Raskin calls in Ella Lipsker to the, and he already realized, okay, this is it. He didn't know what happened. He just he says, where do you go during these days? So he didn't lie. He said, I take music lessons. I like music. And who pays? So he took out some loans. He has no money. And hopefully he'll pay it back at some point. So to his shock, David Raskin, Rabbi David Raskin says to him, from here on, the Dan Hall is going to pay for your music lessons. He couldn't believe it. And he didn't even know why, because he didn't tell him. Months later, Rabbi Raskin told him what the Rebbe said. Now, this doesn't mean that 770 Eastern Park we suddenly established a music department. <laughs> and so, the, obviously, there's still a Seder, but the Rebbe was sensitive and understood. You have to know who you're dealing with. And you can't always, some people, you could say, learning now. But there's some people who are going to be artistic and to try to shut that down, yeah, you can delay, you can create a lot of problems. Now a wise mother has to figure out each case by case. Not everyone's the same. I've seen this time and again. Those that try to some way restrain or stop a talent from being expressed, I don't never see good results. The child develops resentment and when they get old enough and they don't have to ask anymore, you don't have a relationship with them. They'll always say, my mother, my father, they never understood me. They never appreciated. They thought I, they were always afraid something's going to happen. Now, the fears are legitimate. The question is, what's the chassidish approach? So that's the first thing I wanted to say. But something more geula oriented so this is also geula oriented is the following. This I hope I didn't share last night. I'm trying to remember. No, I don't think so. The Rebbe in the year Tavshin Nun Aleph was uh, Shabbos Achari Kedeshim. The Rebbe said at the beginning of Fabrengen that he's getting letters from people who are complaining about Mashiach coming too fast. <laughs> yeah. the, this was the reasoning. He said, we built up a lot of equity in our lives, companies, businesses, networks, money, and Mashiach comes, all that will be to naught. We'll lose everything that we built. You know, people invest their whole lives to build something. They have homes, they have this and that. That's what the Rebbe said. He's reading letters. So the Rebbe smiled and responded and said, there's nothing to be afraid of. Mashiach is not coming to take anything away. He's only coming to add. And the Rebbe used the famous uh, expression that we know today, that the Medr says that Gu'ula is the same words as Gaila. Gaila is golas, displacement. 
And when you add the Aleph, Gaila becomes Gula. So Gula is not taking away, it'll be the, everything you have now, all your furniture and all your belongings and all your connections, but we'll add the Aleph, the Aleph of Hashem, Hashem Echad, Aleph, Aluf Eshelela. So everything will be infused with a higher divine awareness. In the words of the Rambam, Lo Elam El Ladas Hashem Bolvad that the business of the world will be not anything but to know God. That doesn't mean everyone's going to be a theologian. It will mean that we will see the godliness in everything we do. So this leads me to where I share two, two, um, two episodes, I guess, two anecdotes, and then my suggestion. Number one is a letter from the Rebbe to his person who owned a dry cleaners. Cleaners. Mundane like that. And the Rebbe says, everything is divine providence. So the fact that you run a cleaners has a lesson in Aveda Hashem, in serving God. And what's the lesson? What is, it? what is cleaning? You buy a new garment. You wear it once, twice, three times. At some point it gets creased, stained, dirty. And, you know, a normal person, after a while, you can't wear it. So you have to throw it out. No, comes the concept of cleaning. You take it to a cleaners. The cleaners takes the garment. They wash it in water, in warm water, mix it with some chemicals to get rid of the stains, then take it out, dry it, and put it under a heavy press. And there you have, voila, you have a garment almost fresh as new. And you can do this process many times in the life of the garment. And what is the lesson? Like we say every morning, the neshama shenasata bi tahirihi. The neshama you've given me is pure. So everyone is born with a pure soul, like a pure garment clean. And then life takes over. Disappointments, duplicity, hardships, challenges. So we all get creased and we get stained and grime gathers, etc. So we could think, okay, you know, the arrow goes only one way. You started pure, idealistic, clean, innocent. And now, unfortunately, we're all jaded in some way. Comes the lesson from cleaners, no, you take the neshama that was pure, and you immerse it in water. Ain mayim ela teda. Teda is water. Learning teda. So that refreshes it. But not just water. Warm water. Chayis. Passion. Not kalt kite. Indifference and apathy. But warm, varam kite. A warmth. And then you mix chemicals in it. Every mitzvah is another chemical. Whether it's kashras or shabbos. And so on. Every chemical, every mitzvah gets rid of another stain. And then you take out the garment and dry it, and you put it under what? A heavy press. Kabbalah's oil. Malchus Shammai. Oil. Kabbalah's oil is a sense of accountability and responsibility to someone higher than you. That's called oil. Kabbalah's oil. To accept the yoke. And that will create that the neshama tahira is refreshed and it's pure again. And you can do this throughout your entire lifetime. Tremendous letter, tremendous lesson from seemingly something, something so mundane. Let me tell you what happened after I read that letter. I'm walking up Kingston Avenue, which I don't often do, in Crown Heights. And I suddenly noticed the cleaners on Kingston between Empire and uh, Montgomery. And there's a cleaners at the corner of Crown. And there's a cleaners on between the Union and President. And many more. And I'm looking at the cleaners and I say, you know, wow. I never saw cleaners quite the same way. <laughs> the Rebbe took the cleaners of the word of the Goyla, of Golis, and added an Aleph. He suddenly turned the cleaners into a lesson to serve God. What's more Gu'uladik than that? To see nothing changed, it's the same cleaners, but it's an added dimension. And the second anecdote, the second thing I wanted to share was I was invited once to speak at a medical conference. Now, I'm not a doctor, I'm not the son of a doctor. They asked me to speak about the medicine of the future, messianic medicine, so to speak. And I shared, I shared that death and disease and illness is an aberration from the terrorist point of view. It says if Adam and Eve had not eaten from the tree of knowledge, there would be no death. They would live forever. Why? Very simple equation. An ashama, a soul that gives energy and life, doesn't run out of energy. It's not limited. So why should there ever be death? The problem is not the soul's end, the problem is on the body's end. The body, if it's intact and aligned with the soul, so like a cup of water, 
unless evaporation, why would the water ever run out of the cup? However, if the cup gets punctured and the body gets compromised and it doesn't do what God wants it to do, it's like an appliance that ultimately will wear down, be infected, diseased, and die. When Shiach comes, we will repair those punctures so body and soul can live aligned forever without any disease, death, and illness, illness and death. The doctors were very taken by it, but one doctor gets up and asks, so what will happen with us doctors when Mashiach comes? <laughs> so after the prerequisite joke, that maybe that's why you charge so much for a long retirement, I said, you will be doing the most noble work possible. Instead of dealing with the pain and suffering of death, disease, and so on, you will teach us the intimate secrets of God that are embedded in the DNA of human biology and human chemistry and human anatomy and neurology and so on. Because God created the human being in the divine image. Tzalem alikim. And mipsari echzalaka. For my flesh I behold God. So you will teach us the secrets in this flesh, in this body. You don't have to deal with death. You'll be teaching us the secrets of Hashem. And that's what, that's what astronomers will do. We'll learn it from the cosmos, and that's what physicists will do, learning it from the physics of the world, and that's what business people will do, and educators and computer engineers. You name the career, you name the profession, and you can find the aleph of godliness within it. That's cool. We're not talking now later stages of miracles. We're talking about the natural transition from a gagolus conscious world to a gaula conscious world. So I say to you in conclusion here, is this something we cannot apply to ourselves or teach our children? It's so easy to do, you just have to pay attention. Ask your child tonight, today, let's look at something. We're eating a meal now, uh, some other thing they're doing, a project. Let's find the aleph in it, just like the Rebbe found it in the cleaners, and I just mentioned it in the context of the doctors and medicine. Everything has an aleph. You train your children, you train ourselves to look with those eyes, you're doing real gu'ula work. Because what do you think Gula is at the end of the day? It's a transformation of this world. It's not the destruction of the world. It's taking the world that we see from the most mundane things to every detail and seeing the godliness within it, which is there, but it's concealed. It's revealing the Aleph of Gula, of, into Gela, making it into Gula. So if you talk about practical suggestions, and I'm sure there are many, many more, B'schus Noshem Sitkani is the merit of the women of this generation. You have that ability right now. You don't need to do anything. And if you need ideas, you talk to each other. If you need more ideas, feel free to email me or contact me. I'll give you plenty of ideas. I guarantee you, put yourself, apply yourself, you'll find ideas. It's not that complicated. Because we have here a director. That can, if you can find godliness in cleaners, trust me, you can find godliness in anything. You know? And that's the approach that we have to take. And that's real active action. So if you want to look for new ideas, this is a new idea. It's not new in the sense, we don't need, as I said, Yesterday, new mitzvahs and new teirach has shalom. We need new initiatives of how to see Hashem in everything we do. Now, maybe some of you are doing this already, and then great. But there's always more to do. And I don't see a greater way, to, a greater tribute, and a greater way to honor the Rebbe on Gimel Thomas and today Dalat Thomas, the day next day, than doing exactly what the Rebbe told us. Do everything you can. I made just some suggestions here. I am sure if you apply yourself, you'll, find new, you'll, you'll come up with ideas as well. But they should all be actionable. If they become too abstract or too complicated, we don't end up doing it. It has to be practical, something you can do every morning, in the evening, yourself, with your spouse, with your family, with children, grandchildren. And it can be fun. It doesn't have to be very, it's, it can be exciting. And you can incentivize your children with good ideas. They come up with a good idea. Reward them in some way. Show them that, the value of it. That to me is our shlichus in our time, in this period of this so-called hell and the Hester, where we don't see the Rebbe in a revealed way, but the Rebbe is with us and working through us, what we can do to live up to the mission that we were given by the Rebbe, which is really the mission that was given to us by Hashem from the beginning of time, and every generation had its Rebbe that translated to the needs of its particular time period and that time and space in which we find ourselves. And above all, let me say this. Abishtha should bless you all. And the Rebbe's brachas should be fulfilled. He said, you are the Nashim Sitkanyas. That you should have nachas, Yiddish chsidish and nachas from your children and those from grandchildren, great-grandchildren when the time comes. 
and really educate them to be these soldiers and know that we have a mission to bring to the world. And we should all be blessed with good health. And only good news. And be forces of light and agents of shalom, of peace and of harmony in your community. And I'm sure we'll have a ripple effect to other communities all over the world. And we should... Thank you so much.